Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Kelly. This is The Cube, where we go out to the events and we extract the signal from the noise. We find the best guests and bring them to you and share with you, our audience, their knowledge. A Andrew Erlickson is here. He's got an interesting role at, at TenGen. He's Vice President of Education and of Cloud Services. Andrew, welcome to The Cube. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so, Let's see, let's start with the day. Uh, how's it going for you? You know, what are you hearing from, from customers in, in both your roles, left hand, right hand? Uh, yeah, no, this, this is a, the conferences are, are, are really awesome, you know, because we, we get to meet the community that's so critical to our success. Uh, I started off a day by uh, giving our Building Your First Application talk, uh, which is- Oh, that was you, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was me. Yeah. Uh, and you know, for me, doing anything live is always strange because I've actually, you know, do most of the work with the online education and I have the benefit of, of hours and hours of editing for every, every moment I, I, I work, <laughs> so people don't know really what it was like to see me live. Well, and here we are live <laughs> at the Cube. Exactly. So, so exactly. That, that, uh, that, that was one of the first sessions. It really caught my eye. It's a great title. So what do you tell people? How do you get started building your first Mongo app? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we start by polling the audience and figuring out what their experience levels are. And the amazing thing is that, you know, we've had these conferences for a long time, and at every single conference, a really large number of people are just getting started. Uh, almost all of them have a lot of experience with relational databases, so that's a good reference point. Uh, and so we just try to highlight what the high-level goals were, you know, for the product when it started, and uh, and how and, and how do you, how to build applications in it, uh, and, and and not get stuck if you if you come from a relational world. So you have a passion for education. Um, we were talking off camera. Uh, about that, so talk about that a little bit. Sure, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was, um, you know, I was at Stanford uh, in the PhD program there, and, uh, you know, three years ago, four years ago now, you know, Khan Academy popped up, uh, teaching all these kids uh, basically middle school math. And from there, there was a couple of classes, the AI class, the machine le learning class that launched at Stanford, uh, which, and I actually took them at the time after I graduated, 100,000 students in these classes. And, and, and I had tried lots of these online ed things before uh, through uh, iTunes University and whatnot. I had never managed to get through the classes. And I took those classes and I realized that they had really cracked the code on the essential elements to motivate people to get through these classes. And, and so I said, wow, this is amazing. This is really disruptive. And uh, so when I, was, when, I was, when I was looking around for the next thing to do, uh, and at this point, you know, Coursera and Udacity and edX had all launched, uh, and I knew the guy, and I knew the founders of of Tengen. I approached them and I said, I, I want to do this. I want to do this for Tengen. I want to do this for MongoDB. I want to do these online classes with tens, thirty, you know, forty thousand people in the audience. We're going to teach everyone about MongoDB. You know, and prior to that, we had, you know, we had taught maybe a thousand people in person since the inception of the company, and and they thought. Uh, yeah, Andrew's obviously insane, you know, <laughs> but uh, So let's try it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I want him to work here, so uh, let's just indulge him, and, uh, and, and if it doesn't work, we'll put him on something else in, uh, in six months, and it'll be fine. Right, well, what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen, exactly, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the, right. So, uh, so we, we came in on that basis. Uh, actually, I, I think they were so uncertain about it that my original offer letter, rather than saying Vice President of Education, just said Vice President. And so people will introduce me around the company. This is our new vice president. I, I don't know what he's going to be working on. So, so you know, based on that, uh, we we approached these these different companies that were really at the forefront of online ed, and uh, edX was receptive to working with us. This is the Harvard MIT consortium. So uh, we got together with them, uh, and actually Anant Agarwal is their director, and he's he's the first PhD student of my advisor at Stanford. Uh, and I was probably his last. Uh, and Anant, you know, is a famous dude. He, 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 he's the head of the AI lab at, at MIT. Uh, I don't think he knew me, but I knew him. So, uh, so I, I approached him and said, we, we want to use your software. He said, okay. Uh, so we launched the first classes and, and we had 30,000 people sign up for them. And it was, it was amazing. It was just, it was, it, it was, it was a, and, and, and to be honest, what we're doing, the techniques are not that original. They're, they're essentially very close copies of what's going on in, in higher education, but very few companies have used it for workforce development and training. And, and so far you've had, the numbers I believe, 70,000 enrollments? Yeah, yeah, we've had 70,000 plus people, uh, registrations, because some people register in more than one class, uh, since, the, since the inception about a year ago. 
One year. Yeah. So now, you talked about the sort of light bulb went off when you were taking some of these online courses. What was it about them that made them so compelling, and how did you adapt that, uh, adopt that for your, your courses? No, that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. You know, you know uh, when, when you look at these courses, like the way they were traditionally offered, like there would be a Stanford course on learning iOS programming. And so you go to iTunes University and you download the PDF files from the syllabus and, uh, and the assignments and the video lectures are there. But it really felt like a dead course that you were resurrecting. And so you know, you'd watch a few lectures and then work would interfere and you'd say you'd stop. And then before you knew it, uh, you, know, you took a week off because you're busy and then you couldn't really remember what he said two weeks ago and then maybe you don't really have anyone to ask to get a clarification on the assignment. So maybe you skip that problem. And before you know it, you just say, this is just a waste of time. And you just give up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not worth it. And what they did with these online education classes is they ran them like real classes. It was a bit of a gamification effect uh, where they ran them for fixed intervals. And there were deadlines. And nothing motivates like a deadline. And you felt like people were watching. And there was all this energy and activity in the forums. And you can see there were thousands of people asking questions. Everyone was synchronized. And at the end of it, uh, the original Stanford classes, you know, they were offering you the this, this certificate of completion, which they did, uh, which, by the way, wasn't on Stanford stationery because Stanford's okay, well, we had nothing to do with this, you know. Uh, but, but even just these famous professors signing it was enough motivation, and people were working for the certificate. They were working for the badge, you know, for the merit badge. Right. And so uh, I realized that, that they had cracked the code, right, and that people were excited about, about potentially completing the course and, get it, and getting their, their little badge. And so we, we ran very similarly. Uh, and I'd say that we actually probably copied the techniques most closely of Udacity, which is the, because uh, they have very good pedagogical techniques. Uh, they teach for the camera. They understand that teaching for online education is a different experience than teaching in a real classroom. You know, one of the problems a lot of these professors have is that they're famous professors. And so they say, yeah, I'll do an online class. This is what I'll do. I'll teach my class. You put the camera in the back of the room, and I hope you get what you get. And, you know, and, the, and what really needs to be done is you need to you know, view it like a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session in between you and the student and make it more personal. Yeah, it's kind of like taking your legacy app and you know, making it mobile. It exactly. doesn't work. Exactly. You, got, <laughs> you have to think about what's, this, what's the medium. What's the medium? Exactly. So bringing that pressure actually yes. motivated those people. Yes, bringing That's the pressure motivates people. Yeah, people, awesome. people love the excitement and the energy. It's like a little Broadway performance when the class starts and then it kind of goes goes through. And so we did the same thing. And, and so we offer these certificates of completion. Now the relationship with Harvard and MIT is you're using the edX software. That's are, right. Are, are, are there, are there, is there any other collaboration going on there? We contribute back our, our improvements to the software so that they can use them mm -hmm. with other, other partner universities. We, uh, I think they, they liked us a lot because they, they want, they're open source and they're a nonprofit. And they loved what we were doing with open source. They loved the way we live out in the open. They love the transparency. That, that, we, that we allow ourselves to, you know, in, in developing the software, that developers can, can go in, they can see the bug reports, they can, they can look at the source code, and they want, they want the same type of thing for their educational stack. They don't want to be a closed proprietary company. And so they were very excited to work with us because we know how to live on that edge between, you know, between public and private, mm -hmm. where you're living out in the open, but yet you have to operate, obviously, coherently as a, as a company. Do you see, over time, distributing the curriculum through other universities? Is that you know, an uh, opportunity for even globally to get reach where you might not be today? We'd certainly be open to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd be open to it, to syndicating out the classes. Uh, you know, so far, we haven't had to because people seem to be coming to us. But you know, our goal is to educate people about MongoDB on that side of it and just drive the adoption. Yeah. So we have no, no problems with that, sure. Right, so uh, kind of playing off that, your last answer there, so uh, how do you align or how are the education efforts aligned with uh, the larger goals of the company, of growing the company and uh, yeah. you know, building a successful organization? Because um, uh, you know, your CEO, Max Shearson, this morning mentioned that it's all free uh, training education. Um, so you're not monetizing the, ed the education, which I think is a great thing. Right. Um, but, but how do you kind of align the strategy, how do you align education with your larger corporate right. strategy? Oh, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, if you think about uh, you know, us as an open source company, you know, we have to create value, and then to be a, a company that survives, uh, we, have to, we have to harvest some value uh, to make money. And you know, the creation of the value is through the open source software and having a community edition. And education is part of the creation of that value. Mm -hmm. So by educating people how to use it, and by lower and by you know, reducing the friction to adopting the software, we get more users. And by having a bigger community of users, you know, there's more potential people who might be interested in our subscription editions, uh, that are interested in our proprietary features in those editions. 
So it, it just increases and it enhances the size of the entire ecosystem for MongoDB. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, this conference right today is, is in a sense an education, ed educational resource, right? For a lot Absolutely. of the, a lot of the, uh, the attendees. That's right, that's right. I mean, what you realize with tech companies is education is marketing mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Yep. And you know, these conferences, they're very reasonably priced. Uh, they're made to be convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, they're one day long, so they're very, so so they don't interrupt people's schedules. They're in a lot of different cities, mm -hmm. and it's the same exact idea. And so I, I really think the edu this education thing uh, and the online education and the MOOCs are a, you know, a natural successor and, and complement to what we're doing with community. Mm -hmm. and, and where do you see this going in terms of innovation of new ways to, to reach people? Um, what, I mean, I'm sure you've got lots of ideas to expand this in, to even in new directions. What, what are some of the innovations you're looking to maybe implement and yeah. uh, take this in another step? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, MOOCs have taken the world by storm in the United States, and there's a, there's a lot of excitement about them. Uh, you know, I actually think that they're more interesting for professional development than they are for higher ed. And, you know, the reason is, if you look at any disruptive innovation, right, like you look at recorded music, mm -hmm. right, I mean, 200 years ago, 150 years ago, all the music we were listening to, we were, we were seeing live. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they came out with recorded music, which wasn't necessarily quite as good as live music, they didn't, input, they didn't put it in front of audiences in Carnegie Hall. They tried right. to, right? <laughs> yeah. They would be pretty disappointed, right? <laughs> yeah. They, they, put it in, they, they put it in places where normally music wasn't a possibility for you, like your living room mm -hmm. and eventually your car, mm -hmm. right? And I think that it, it, the online education, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, if you look at our online classes today, two thirds of the students are from South America and from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's because these are the non-consumers. You know, these are the people who have no other venue or option. Mm -hmm. uh, if your parents, if you can get into Harvard and your parents can pay for it, you should go. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's great, right? Why not? But on the other hand, if you're in the workplace and you don't have time to go back for regular, regular uh, classes or, 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 or go back to school, that's when this format works so well because it can fit in the, all the interstitial spaces of your life and you can you can you can advance your career that way. Mm. So so is that typically the the student you're you're trying to reach is really the, the somebody who's in, in the midst of their career. They're not going to you know take two years off to go back to school. Yeah. They're looking to develop their skills. They want to stay current. They know Mongo's an important part of the growing kind of big data data management ecosystem. And so this is where that kind of can fit into their life in a way that makes sense to them and really provides some value. That, that that's 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 exactly right. I mean, and you know we didn't know who would show up, but that's who showed up. Um, I'm excited about it because a lot of the places that people are taking the courses, we hardly even have business operations. Well, so, right. you know, we're driving adoption, getting that market ready for a day when we may come in and actually talk to them about what we have to offer right. you know, on a premium side. Well, that, that struck me when you were, we were talking. I mean, this is a great source of data for you about where the interest in Mongo is, is you yep. know, how it's ebbing and flowing in different maybe geographic locations, maybe um, by vertical industries, whatever the case might be. And uh, another way to use that Data where it's a, it's a win-win for the for the student and a, and a win for Mongo and able, in, in the sense that you're able to mine that data and, and you know develop some services around that and find new markets to, to target. No, that that that's exactly right. So uh, so the education piece is going well and I and and uh, and I was you know I was super excited that it was so successful. I, I was very passionate about it coming in and of course you never really know, <laughs> you know. Uh, and as an engineer, you're always a little bit field of dreams, mm -hmm. right? You're like, you build it and they will come, and you know, and, 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 and sometimes they do, and sometimes mm -hmm. they don't. So Engineers and VCs. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right, uh, exactly right. Uh, and so about a month and a half ago, I took on uh, this new role of uh, the GM of cloud services, mm -hmm. which is something that we're just really dabbling in at this point. Uh, we've had a monitoring service that people uh, don't know a lot about, but it's a free monitoring service for MongoDB. Mm -hmm. And we recently introduced a, a backup service as well, uh, where we will back up your MongoDB databases, uh, give you point in time restore, uh, very reasonably priced, uh, and you can turn it on in, in, in probably 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not really aimed at the enterprise, but instead uh, aimed at businesses, startups, and whatnot. That you know, backup's not their core competency. They're not really, and they just want it to work. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, and I, and I have a lot of, my background is in cloud services, so I was excited to get into that, you know, get back into that, mm -hmm. uh, that world of offering you know, cloud services to users. So let's talk about that a little bit, because that's, sure. the, that's the right side of your brain. Yeah, um, yep, that's right. Cloud services. Uh, so talk about what you guys are doing in cloud services. You've you got some relatively new services around backup, and, and you've enhanced your monitoring, but, but, but talk about your role there and what, what TenGen does there. 
Yeah, so uh, you know, we're really building out the different tools that you need to run the database in the enterprise. Mm. Uh, so the community additions are, is, a, is a great database. It, it is missing certain features that enterprises tend to want around security and authentication. It's also missing, uh, it, was, it, it was also, the community edition also doesn't have monitoring. So we went and we built out a monitoring component. We offer it in two different ways. Uh, if you're an enterprise customer, you can, you can get the bits and you can run it in your own data center. And if you're a smaller company, we'll monitor your database for you, for free. Uh, and then, uh, which, which if you become a support customer, if you get a subscription and it comes with support, is great because it helps to support people, help you when you have a problem. Uh, and so a natural extension of that was this backup piece. And to solve another part of the enterprise problem, which is backing up your database. Now, you know, backup is something that, you know, it's a little bit mundane and boring. It's like, oh, backup, who cares about backup? But it's also hard to do it well. Everybody right. cares when you lose data. Yeah, everyone cares when you lose data. <laughs> First exactly. question you get, are you yeah. backed up? Are you backed up? Uh. <laughs> and you know, what people don't realize about backups is that most of the restores are not because of catastrophic failure. Yeah, most, of, most of the restores are because of human error, fat fingering as they say, messing something up, doing a bad release and deleting data. And maybe that deletion is propagated amongst all your replica sets and all of a sudden you've deleted it everywhere. And so, you know, I like to think of this, you know, window of vulnerability, which is how far behind are the backups. And a typical customer that does their own backups will simply take a snapshot every six hours. Uh, and, and that's fine, but uh, the snapshot can often, uh, is often a large load in the system during, the during, that, during that interval. Uh, and so well, let's, we said, well, how does this, if you really wanted to do it right, how would you do it right? And to do it right, you would have a continuous you know, real-time backup. Uh, and so what our backup system does is it reads your replication log, and so we might be just minutes behind you. So if you actually, for some reason, lost everything, we could restore you to three minutes ago. So window of vulnerability, I like that term. A lot of people talk in terms of RPO, re recovery point objective, right. and they, they say that's the business term. And I go, what business person you've ever met talks about RPO, nobody. But window of vulnerability. It's much more intuitive a, term for that's me. That's an intuitive business term. <laughs> yeah. Basically, it's like, how much data are you willing to lose? Huh? Exactly. Oh, oh, I get it. Okay, so you're basically saying you're, you're taking people's will, window of vulnerability down from six hours, because maybe they back up twice a day, three exactly. times a day, four times a day, down to minutes. Um, 15 minutes, mi less than that? It, it could be less than that. It could be less than that. It, 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 it could be just a few minutes, you know, because we're, we're, we're real time taking their, their op log data. And the other thing about backup is you never really know whether they're working. You know, right. like you're not confident. Are the backup's even working properly? I mean, you know, so you try to do a restore every once in a while. It's the kind of thing, it, you know, it's kind of like watching the instruments, you know, on an airplane. It's like, it's like nothing's ever happening. And so humans are particularly bad at this type of activity. You know, where the, where the default is, nothing's going on. Well, I think that, that you're right on there because one practitioner said to me, you know, all this data growth, how do you back up a petabyte? And he said to me, you don't. <laughs> you know? He's right. You basically do you know, Apple time machine for the enterprise. Right, no, you, know? you, no, it, well, you can't imagine taking a full L0 backup when, when a data set gets large enough. And, and the way our backup system works is we take, we take an initial sync. You got to seed it. We have to seed it. And after that, we never take a full sync again from them. We just take the incremental data from their op log and bring it into our so data So how center. do you seed it? You have some kind of throttle or do you actually ship a, a, a disk or? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, we don't take ship disks today, but someday we may need to for big enough databases. Today, it just takes a while. Today, we, the initial sync is a full copy of their database over the internet. Okay. And then, uh, you know, after that, we take, we, we're taking permanently incremental data. So it's so well, very carbonite-like. I mean, you, you start, well, it, it, it sort of trickles in over it, it, a week or it, so. It is, it, is similar, it is similar to what they do. Uh, the difference is, though, that this is really built and, and tuned uh, for MongoDB. Yeah, not for a laptop. Yeah, yeah and, yeah. and, it's, and you know, it understands MongoDB's interface. It reads MongoDB's op log. Mm -hmm. uh, we, don't, we don't back up generic files. We can't back up your laptop. And, and, and carbonite actually has no, has no module to, to back up MongoDB. Uh, so in that sense, it's not particularly competitive, but uh, oh but yeah, in no, sense it's back up. Yeah, the concept. Yeah, of, yeah, it is, of it basically is, seeding it once and then taking no, that's a true. incremental daily. You that's know, true. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's that's <laughs> that, that's very true. It is a it is a similar a similar concept. Yeah, good. Yeah, and uh, does it tie into disaster recovery at all? Or oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, for good DR, you know, you want to be far enough away that when you lose your primary data center, that 
uh, you're going to be able to come back. And, uh, and, and, and not only uh, you know, are we a data center that's, a, that's far away from, from you, but we also run in multiple data centers and, and keep them far enough away from each other that, they're, that, there's a, that it's DR you know, compatible, or, or if you will. So, but the further away you go, you know, speed of light problems, right? The greater your window of vulnerability. So, uh, you know, but you know, the truth is you're 80 milliseconds from Beijing. So that's not a real issue, <laughs> you know. It, it is true, you know. There's an there's an, ex, there's an expression, uh, you know, in engineering, you, know, you 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 can buy bandwidth, but you know, for latency, talk to God, yeah. you know. <laughs> and uh, that <laughs> that is true, that is true. But uh, it's mostly a bandwidth issue at mm -hmm. the end of the day, uh, because it, you know, I mean, let's say that we're really far away from the person, we're 80 milliseconds away. So that's not that's not the real issue. The real issue is that as you get further away from a person, unless you're edge cached and you're thinking about where to position yourself. You may not. You just may not have enough bandwidth to take that. Yeah, you're not talking about fire transactions hose. here, right? I mean, generally, right? You're not talking about you know. You're, take, you're talking about ATM, oblog data. A, a, yeah, it's not ATM transactions, right? So. Uh, well, most of our you, a, a, ATM transactions, in particular, are probably the least likely thing to be on MongoDB. No, that's like, what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, but yeah. but um, but only because, and I think actually, uh, we have some features that, you know, that, that that could be used for ATM transactions uh, today. Not on MongoDB. But uh, you know, <laughs> traditionally, th you know, these have uh, these have gone to to uh, relational databases. Uh, right. You know, if you think about relational transactions, actually, and particularly the ATM problem, I thought about this. You think about the number of people there are in the U.S. and how often they take out money. It's it's actually not that many, and and, and it's actually not that big a problem. I think what MongoD where MongoDB really shines is in all of this machine generated data and all this observational data that works a lot faster than humans could type, right? Like, you know, the entire Library of Congress, you know, could probably fit in uh, a, few, a, a few terabytes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm probably even uh, less than a, than a terabyte. Uh, you know, War and Peace is under a megabyte, I think, right? And, and so these, anything that's human created is, is, not, is not that large. But then you look at something like machine-generated data, like, Clickstream traffic or photos mm. and videos, you know, machines generating data from machines, and that's when the data, that's when it becomes just you know, overwhelming. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. We, we were at the GE event earlier this week talking about the industrial internet and all this industrial equipment that's now creating yes. you know, it's sensor technology on jet engines, on wind turbines, on MRI machines, and you name it. And in, in healthcare, I mean, patients themselves are where we're wearing. Uh, the you know Fitbit and we're creating uh, data yep. on, you know on the on our person. So I mean, uh, it's machine machine data clearly is is really I think where this is going next in terms of uh, the ability to store it, optimize it, and optimize processes around the creation of that data. I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look on your iPhone today, and you look at where your storage is going, you'll probably find that about three to five percent of it is data that you created by hand, and the rest of it is machine sample data. I mean, music is machine sample data, mm -hmm. right? People play music and then machine sample it. Exactly. So, yeah, so most of the data in the world is machine sample. So, you're, yeah. Andrew, you're a startup guy. I How am. did you end up in this role and so passionate about education and obviously the cloud piece? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I am a startup guy, and this is in fact my first real job uh, I've ever had. Uh, you know, before this, I, I started a couple of companies. Uh, you know, my experience with the founders goes way back. Uh, I sold my, my first company to DoubleClick in 2000, and uh, Dwight Merriman wa was my boss at the time. Uh, and uh, you know, I had been following what was going on with TenGen and MongoDB. My first company was actually a, a little database company. It was called Flashbase, databases in a flash. <laughs> so yeah, so this was a kind of a returning to my roots. And the education thing was also a passion because you know I did a, a photo sharing startup. I you know I have a lot of high-end digital SLR equipment at home. You know I've always loved that side of things and the technical aspects, the precision mm -hmm. of all that stuff. And and online ed was an opportunity to spend a tremendous amount of money on studio equipment, yeah. you know, <laughs> copy stands, and high-end cameras. Talking our language now. Yeah, don't no, be too I, critical. I, of I, that I love that stuff. I love that stuff. Yeah, we, we have this lighting kit, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, I, I recognize it. Yeah. yeah, right. It's nice that it's not it's too a, hot. Yeah. So, so do you still pay attention? You must to the capital markets. I mean, what are you seeing? What are you seeing there? Uh, you In know, New York, I, California. You know. You know, I don't pay. I don't. I don't pay a tremendous amount of attention uh -huh. to the capital markets. Uh, my only capital market, I, had a, I worked at BlackRock when I first came yeah, to New yeah. York, uh, when it was a 200 person uh, company managing $180 billion. So you're uh, not in touch totally with the VC scene in New yeah, York? Yeah, in, you in, know, in, I, in, I, uh, I, keep, I keep up with it, yeah. but you know, I'm kind of, um, you know, I, I'm an obsession kind of guy, 
And so whatever, you know, when I, I, I took some time off to double click and I ran marathons and that was all I did. You know, people would see me at parties and they try to get anything out of me and all I could tell them was like the races I had run. <laughs> and, uh, you know. That's great. And, and, I, and, and so I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't obsess over that. I mean, I read the usual blogs. I'm probably reading the same blogs you do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not into that, into that scene right now. Okay, good. All right, Andrew, listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Uh, man of great passion, and uh, good luck with uh, the journey, and uh, please come back to theCUBE. Love to have you again. All right, well, thank you very much. All right, pleasure. All right, everybody, keep it right there. Jeff Kelly and I will be back to wrap up the day. We're live in New York. This is theCUBE. <laughs>